Hello, and a very warm welcome to today's Cell and Gene Therapy Insights webinar. I'm Elisa Manzotti, CEO and founder of BioInsights, and today we'll be discussing optimizing process development to simplify manufacturing scale-up of therapeutic viral vectors. So something we hear a great deal about in the industry is about the bottlenecks in viral vector manufacturing. And one area in particular is optimization of production during upstream process development to really simplify manufacturing scale-up of viral vectors. So today we'll be hearing from Alengo Neumanantu, Scientific Support and Communications Specialist at Polyplus Transfection, who will be discussing why virus vector production using the right transient transfection approach and combined cell culture system is absolutely crucial to achieve process performance whilst complying with quality requirements for process development and clinical grade manufacturing. So following her presentation today, she will be joined by our expert panel for Q&A session, during which we would love to hear from our audience members. So do feel free to post a question in the Ask a Question box, and we'll try to get to it during the webinar. So with that, I will hand over to Alengo for her presentation. Thank you, Elisa. And thank you all for attending the webinar on optimizing process development to simplify manufacturing scale-up of therapeutic viral vectors. So my name is Alengo Nyamayantu. I am the Scientific Communication Specialist at PolyPlus Transfection, and I will be replacing my colleague, Valerie Kiddinger, today. Before we open up the panelist discussion, I will first provide an overview on the current state of viral vector upscaling and address the main bottleneck of upstream process development, upscaling transfection that is required to achieve manufacturing scale-up of therapeutic viral vector production. For those who are not familiar with PolyPlus Transfection, we are a biotech company that has over 20 years of experience in the development of transfection solutions for mammalian cells. And we are, as far as we know, the market leader for AAV biomanufacturing. This expertise is based on our initial invention of polyethanol imine, PI or PI, as a transfection reagent in the 90s. And since then, we have intensively invested in cationic polymer research to offer the most innovative and performant transfection solutions to cover all mammalian cell-based applications. We're available worldwide and are ISO 9001 certified since 2002. The way we are organized at PolyPlus Transfection is that we subdivide our transfection reagents per application with reagents for R&D, so these transfection reagents are developed for delivery of any type of nucleic acid, for routine transfection of proof-of-concept experiments, transfection reagents for direct therapy. So these in vivo transfection reagents can be directly administered into animal models or human, and it can be for any type of nucleic acid. We have a GMP-grade version, version of in vivo jet PI, that is available since 2006. And thirdly, transfection reagents for biomanufacturing of biologics. So these reagents can be used for development and industrial processes, for example, to produce ATNPs, such as viral vectors, and this is today's focus. Viral vector manufacturing. What are the key steps and what are the main bottlenecks associated with upscaling production? As you know, Viral vectors is the preferred delivery method in the majority of ongoing nucleic acid therapy strategies to efficiently carry a gene of interest into target cells by either direct injection into a patient, so that would be gene therapy, and or by first transducing patient isolated cells that will then be re-injected into the patient, cell therapy. The increased use of viral vectors in the clinical setting has underlined the urgent need for process development systems that are capable of generating very large amounts of highly pure and controlled viral particles. Manufacturing large amounts of viral particles, and we're talking 10 to the 10, 10 to the 14 VG RTU per ml, depending on the viral vector produced, is challenging and costly. So what are the key steps in the manufacturing process that one should focus on to maximize to maximize viral titer yields. In the upstream process, it is the production amount reach which mainly depends on the transfection method used. And this will be the focus of today's webinar. In the downstream process, 
It is the amount of recovered, purified viral vector that is determinant. It is currently one of the major issues that viral manufacturers face, with sometimes up to 70% in loss of viral particles. Viral vectors can be produced either by transient transfection or by stable producing cell lines. For the moment, the majority of viral vector production processes are performed through transient transfection, simply because it is the method to reach highest productivity. For transient transfection, several plasmids need to be transfected, generally two to four, depending on the recombinant virus produced, in HEC293 cell lines and derivatives. The use of transient transfection comes with both disadvantages and advantages. It can be costly. Several plasmids are needed, and they will need, as you go up in the manufacturing scale and quality requirements, to be at a certain point GMP grade. And you are dependent on the quality, reliability offered by suppliers for your DNA, for the cell culture medium, for your transfection reagent. What are the advantages? The main advantage is that transfection, that transient transfection, is still the method to reach highest viral titer yields. On top of that, it provides you with flexibility. It's compatible with most commonly used cell culture systems, and I'm talking adherent and suspension. And it is fast. It remains time consuming to develop and validate stable cell lines. So what are the current upstream manufacturing challenges, and how can you improve your upstream bioprocessing? And of course, secure meeting raw material quality requirements from the get-go. To improve viral vector production yield, it is essential to rely on a transient transfection method that can guarantee consistent and reproducible transfection efficiencies. The key to reaching consistent and reproducible viral titer yields. As a solution, we will show you why our PI base and improved reagent PI Pro is the preferred PI base method for viral vector manufacturing. I will further demonstrate that scalable transient transfection is achievable in both adherent and suspension systems when using PI Pro. When developing PI Pro for large scale use, we took into consideration cell culture key parameters and how to achieve large scale preparation of transfection complexes. These, param these parameters were further validated during viral vector scale-up in different cell culture systems by our key customers, some of which have agreed to take part of the webinar today. As I mentioned earlier, Fully Plus Transfection is the company that was founded by scientists who invented PI for transfection. So we have more than two decades of expertise on this particular molecule for transfection. Based on this expertise, we were pioneers in identifying key chemical properties that make PI Pro the best PI for viral vector production. Why? So PI is a polymer with repeating units of the same monomer. And we have identified the ideal numbers of monomers, in short, the length of the polymer, its state, linear instead of branched, and the working concentration in solution for easiness of use. Therefore, PI Pro corresponds to a ready-to-use water solution containing an optimized linear PI. On top of that, we've developed a strict manufacturing process for PI Pro, which allows us to precisely control the synthesis of PI Pro and ensure a defined specific concentration of PI at a defined size. And this is illustrated here with the low polydiperse peak, which ensures best performance and reproducibility. Conversely, when you have a more polydiperse peak, meaning a wider range, as you can see in red, this PI solution contains several lengths, fragments of PI, that are not optimal for transfection. And with longer fragments comes with cell toxicity, and with shorter fragments, you have a reduced ability to form stable complexes with the DNA of interest. This combined PI molecule optimization and strict release control is what makes PI Pro stand out from other PI that are available. Less DNA and PR are required when using PI Pro to reach higher viral titer yields, as shown here for AAV production, represented here in infectious titer per ml. With two times less DNA, 
and more than four times less and up to eight times less reagent, you can nicely see here that with PI Pro, you reach higher viral titer yield compared to a competitor, PI Max. Not only is PI Pro more performant than other commercially available PI, such as PI Max, but it is also standing out from other methods, such as calcium phosphate. So, by the way, calcium phosphate is also limited to adherent cell culture systems, as it requires the presence of serum. Furthermore, due to our stringent release specifications, we can guarantee high lot-to-lot -lot reproducibility, as illustrated here. You can see that we've produced a protein of interest. You can nicely see that among the different lot numbers of PI Pro, you have very similar production yields. So this makes our PI Pro a reliable transfection reagent and enables you to repeatedly achieve similar production yields once your process is in place. When talking about production scale-up from a transfection point of view, we have identified key considerations to take into account early on during process development to facilitate scaling up of transient transfection in order to achieve similar viral vector titers. So which cell culture system, adherent or suspension, what is the impact of the cell culture medium, when scaling up, transfection complexes will need to be prepared at larger scale, how can one address the need to reduce the complexation volume for easier handling, and how long are the transaction complexes stable when you prepare at a larger scale, as you will need to add them to a larger volume in the bioreactor, and this will require more time. So first step, which cell culture system, adherent or suspension? So as you know, both adherent and suspension systems are currently used during process development, and for both scale-out or scale-up of manufacturing. Today, we're going to focus on scale-up. Hence, we wanted to make sure that with PI Pro, transient transaction scaling up could be achieved in both adherent and suspension systems, systems. So we wanted to make sure that for adherent systems, you could go from initial flasks to cell stacks or cell factories and up to microcarrier or macrocarrier bioreactors, such as the iCell is from Paul. And in suspension, from flasks, to steer tank bioreactors of a couple liters to, to more than 100 liters. So to achieve scalability, we made sure that preparation of PI Pro DNA transaction mix could be simplified in order to develop an easily scalable protocol based on the amount of cells per ml or per centimeter square. So usually one to two million cells is a good starting point in both systems. And with that, we developed um, DNA PI Pro ratios of usually one to one to two that corresponds to both adherent and suspension systems, which allows you initially to test in both systems and see which one is more adapted to your process development. In both cases, the complexes are prepared the same way. By premixing a diluted PI Pro solution, into a diluted DNA plasmid solution. And the premixing is key. And you need to wait around 10 minutes before you can add these premix complexes to the cell culture. During process development, it is prefer preferable to choose a cell culture medium that is compatible for cell maintenance, transaction, and for viral vector production and harvesting, just in terms of cost. And we tested whether our PI Pro was compatible with the most commonly used commercially available medium for both adherent and suspension systems for growing HEC293 cell lines and derivatives. And this is just um, an initial list that we're sharing with you. If you're working with any other type of media, we can maybe also um, give you more information on whether PI Pro is compatible with this medium. As you can see, in CD293, GIBCO medium, uh, virus yield using PI Pro is really not optimal, so we actually do not recommend using this last medium. For efficient scaling up preparation of complexes, it is important to make sure that from the get go, the complexation protocol is strictly followed and kept during the scaling up. And what we're going to show you today is that depending on how you choose to premix your DNA with PI Pro, 
the size of your complexes can vary. There are two ways to prepare a DNA PI Pro mix. Either you could dilute your PI Pro and add it on the diluted DNA and incubate at room temperature for around 10 to 15 minutes, or the other way around. The diluted DNA is added on the diluted PI Pro and incubated at room temperature. But this has an impact, and this is why we provide a strict protocol to follow, because as you can nicely see here, um, the size of the DNA PI Pro complexes do continue to grow when you add the DNA on top of the PI Pro and not the other way around. So at small scale, this has less of an impact as you can quickly add the complexes to the cells. But when you're working with a larger volume, it will require additional time to add the complexes to the cells. And therefore, it can lead to a reduced transfection efficiency. So in short, keeping exactly the same method of preparation, you want to keep the same method of preparation from small scale to large scale. So from the get-go, it's important to add the PI Pro onto the DNA during complexation. The order of complexation is not the only parameter that plays a role. We anticipated by having a look at the influence of DNA concentration on the size of the complexes. And we could show that with high DNA concentrations of 50 microgram DNA per ml, with our standard DNA PI Pro ratio of 1 to 1, the size of the complexes was still optimal for transfection. And that's around 400 to 800 nanometers. and did not really vary during the measurement. This is reassuring because during scale up, one would prefer to work with the smallest complexation volume that is possible without impacting formation of complex and consequently productivity. For example, for a one liter cell culture volume, we typically recommend preparing complexes in 10% of the final volume. So when you're working at larger scale, it is desirable to reduce the complexation volume. And with PI Pro, we're constantly working on seeing how far we can bring down the final volume of preparation of complexes. So now we can go down to 5% of the total cell culture volume, which is definitely a gain from 10%. And you see that you're reaching a final DNA concentration in the transaction mix of 20 microgram of DNA per ml, which is still beneath uh, the information I showed you in the previous slide, which illustrates how stable the complexes are at higher DNA uh, concentration. So we're working to see how low we can keep bringing down that final volume. What about the stability of the DNA PI Pro complexes? So I've already touched a bit on that. And DNA PI Pro complexes are relatively stable when you prepare them in different media, and even when you're using less than ideal DNA PI Pro ratios, such as the 1 to 6 ratio depicted here in red. So this offers additional flexibility to you as an end user. Another important parameter is the time of incubation. And we like to calculate the time of incubation from initial start of premixing of the complexes to their addition to the cell culture medium, so in the end to the bioreactor. Because that's a parameter that's bound to vary considerably when you're scaling up, simply because you're now working with larger volumes. So at small scale, making sure that the complex is already incubated for around about 15 minutes and then quickly add it to the cells is easily achievable. But what about large scale? So this is why we took in consideration when we optimized the protocol with PI Pro to make sure that the window of PI Pro's potency is not too narrow to facilitate scaling up. And as you can see here, the percentage of transfected cells not really decrease below one hour of total incubation time, which should give you sufficient time to have the complexes either added to the bioreactor by gravity or pumped in at a reasonable speed. And that's important for the pumping in to make sure that you preserve the size of the complexes, which should be between 400 and 800 nanometer, for optimal transaction. Here I've chosen to illustrate the successful scaling up of viral vector production by showing you what some of our customers could achieve at different scales using PI Pro product range. So I believe that with this table, you can already get a feel of the flexibility and production yields that you could reach using PI Pro in adherence systems, so hyper stacks, cell stacks, 
our popular system, but so is the macrocarrier I cell is fixed bed by a reactor from Paul. And in suspension cells from shaker flax to steer tank bioreactors. And as you can nicely see here, these are data given for lentivirus and AAV production. In terms of productivity and scaling up, we have you covered, but what about the initial one of the initial disadvantages raised when using a transient transaction approach? So with the move of projects from early clinical phase to fast approval and soon to commercialization, there is an increased need for quality and sustainable supply of raw materials for virus production. And the current guidelines for quality of raw materials are clear. It is recommended to use clinical grade reagents when available. And as it is already the case for plasmid DNA and cell culture media, now it is becoming very important to also have the transaction reagent provided at GMP grade. So this is why we've developed both PI Pro HQ for preclinical manufacturing and PI Pro GMP for GMP manufacturing. And with the launch of our GMP grade PI Pro at the end of last year, we're happy to be, to be able to supply reliably all of these um, PI Pro at different quality grades so that you can have a complete set of the exact same PI-based transaction reagents to develop initially your process and to continue on to clinical grade production and commercialization. And just a small word on PI Pro GMP. So it is GMP compliant raw material that can be used for ATMP manufacturing and it can manufacture in compliance with international GMP guidelines both at the chemical synthesis and aseptic fill and finish steps. And to finish off, and I think this is the most important slide for you as an end user, with PI Pro, PI Pro HQ, or PI Pro GMP, we can guarantee comparable AAV viral titers. This just means that it is exactly the same PEI based transaction reagent at just different quality grades, and that what you've initially developed during your process development, you can continue using exactly the same process in order to produce higher quality grade viral vectors. And finally, of course, our PI Pro GMP, like PI Pro and PI Pro HQ, we can ensure identical reproducibility among different lots. So to conclude, I'd like to finish off by saying that at least from a transient transaction standpoint, we started to address the main concerns. And I am looking forward to um, this discussion with our panelists today to see how we can move forward. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Alingo, for your presentation, which I think really sets the scene nicely for our discussion today. So, Alingo will now be joined by our expert panel for today. First is Chris Lorenz, Senior Director, Process Sciences and Manufacturing at Ordentes Therapeutics where he was brought in to start up their internal manufacturing operations from scratch. In late 2016, Audentis began GMP manufacturing for their pipeline of AAV-based gene therapy programs. Next up is Rachel Legman, Senior Manager of Cell Culture Process Development Lab at Paul Life Sciences, where she is focusing on technology transfer of various viral vectors, providing manufacturing support activities, combining biological and engineering aspects, and maximizing process efficiencies and product quality for viral vector manufacturing. And our final panelist is Kathy Webb, Senior Director for GMP Operations at Paragon Bioservices. Kathy is responsible for the upstream manufacturing operations at Paragon and has experience with a variety of production processes utilizing stable cell lines, transient expression, macular viral expression vectors, and microbial fermentation. So welcome everybody and thank you very much indeed for joining me today. So I think Alengo nicely honed in on one of the current bottlenecks in viral vector manufacture. But I think it would be really useful, given the experience of our panel here, to hear about their real-world experiences of viral vector manufacture. And in particular, what specific pain points have they encountered as you sort of move towards commercial scale? I think, Chris, it'd be great to start with you here from the sort of therapeutic developer perspective. Yeah, hi, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, Alengo, I think in one of her slides highlighted um, you know, that ideally you were keeping the same method of preparation as you scale. Um, absolutely, I think that's, that's important, but unfortunately as you go from, say, one liter or, or, or benchtop scale to 
say up to 500 liter as we're at with uh, at Adentes Therapeutics. There's just operational logistics that uh, get involved, you know, um, that that, that um, end up being quite challenging. Um, you know, particularly I think on the aseptic operation side, you know, prepping a few mils of a transfection reagent at, at small scale is very straightforward in the hood. Prepping what might be tens or dozens of liters uh, at larger scale proves to be much, much more challenging, even as you can, as Alengo pointed out, perhaps reduce your transfection volume as you scale up. Your, to your total volume still ends up being um, quite substantial. So I just think some of those operational logistics, as you, as you just increase that volume, unfortunately, you know, uh, it, 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 it gets to be quite challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And then, uh, Rachel, how about from your perspective? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction, and thank you, everybody, for joining the webinar and letting me express our poll experience on that. So I would say, as you're going larger scale, you are facing a challenge of lot-to-lot -lot variability because of the large volume. You have to remember that uh, the challenges currently is the cell line that we are using. The transient transfection is a very big uh, bottleneck for this process. And also the, uh, the uh, variability of the material that you are putting into the process. So when you are load scaling up the process, you have to take into consideration a multiple factors uh, for the current existing market situation with the gene therapy, with the viral vector uh, production. So, so as long as we are having uh, adherent cells, for example, then you have to make sure that you are moving into automation to reduce significantly the manipulation, and that will reduce the lot-to-lot -lot variation. Uh, you, are, you have to use the right trans, uh, transfection reagent that will be friendly and will reproduce and less toxic when you are lodging the volume of your process. And even if you are doing suspension cell, you are still facing the challenge of the number of cells that you can reach during the transfection, and you have to make sure the cells are in a very healthy situation in order to uh, increase the efficiency of the trans transient transfection when you, when you move to a large scale. So this is just the, uh, the uh, tip of the iceberg, but moving to a large scale, you have to uh, uh, combine multiple factor, and transient transfection currently is one of the major bottleneck, but not the only one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And then Kathy, coming to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I think a lot of what you've just heard does um, describe a lot of what the bottlenecks are. Um, in the presentation, there was a nice display of the different factors that do lead into the efficiency of the transfection. Um, being more on the GMP side, uh, we definitely work closely with our process development team, um, and we work for methodologies that will scale up um, to our production level, um, but thinking about those things early on, how you want to standardize and think about what your ultimate end goal is, uh, is definitely um, something that is best to think about as you start developing your process. Yeah, absolutely. And how early do you think is optimal? When we hear that sort of often, everyone's saying, start the thinking as, as early as possible. But from your experience, what would you tend to advise? I think once you start, um, you know, getting to the bioreactor scale, um, you know, just thinking about the the different mechanisms in which you're going to put your components together and, and how you envision that happening, reducing risk um, within your, your program, but you can replicate things at a smaller scale. You can kind of push the boundaries sometimes to think about what some of the implications might be, especially if you have the ability to run multiple reactors. Um, you might want to investigate some of these things at the bench scale. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And so what factors inform the decision of which culture system to use, uh, adherent versus suspension? Kathy, if we come to you on this one first. Sure. Um, being a contract manufacturer, we obviously work very closely with our clients, um, and there are some things that they come to us with um, right away in terms of their program. Uh, one of the things that they 
uh, might already have a strong inclination for is to where they're sourcing their cell line and if it's adherent or suspension. So uh, we work with them, you know, to define basically the cell line and system that they're looking at. Uh, they also may have a preference in terms of the platform in which they envision their program. Um, and, you know, there's quite a difference in the hardware in terms of the suspension bioreactors versus uh, the adherent systems. Um, so there are options out there, which is great. But again, I think a large part of it depends uh, upon the client as to where they see their program going in the future. And then sometimes there is also that time constraint in terms of how much time do they want to invest or have the time to invest in looking at, at options. You know, we have worked with clients before to, um, you know, they might have been in an adherent system and, you know, once we've worked and provided some data, you can look at some comparisons in suspension and, and see if it's a viable process. But um, anytime you make a change, it will add some additional time to, to your development. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And then, Rachel, you sort of touched upon some of the pros and cons around adherent versus suspension question one. I wondered if you could sort of elaborate upon your thoughts there. Yes. Um, thank you, Eliza. Uh, what happened is that in process development services that Paul uh, is offering, and I'm uh, uh, running one of the uh, lab here, uh, as Kathy mentioned, when they get into the CMO, we are actually a, a earlier stage for that. So the client come to us either from a current flat work procedure in order for us to do all the development and bring the process into CMO uh, the moment they want to run faster. So at this point, it's all what I'm asking the client, uh, and this is in addition to what Kathy said, is what is your end target? Uh, what is your application? What disease are you targeting? How many viral vector you need per dose? And how many patients you need? So we, I will have an understanding what is the maximum commercialization scale. So it depends with the application. Some of them do not need to reach to a higher number of viral vector. Therefore, uh, adherent cell is still applicable. And we have the Icellis that we are working with, and the client is very happy moving into the manufacturing uh, with adherent cells when you, we can uh, eliminate the serum because uh, the Icellis uh, bioreactor enable that. But at the same time, if clients come to me with a very large number of viruses needed per dose, and it's a systematic injection, and they have a lot of patients globally, they need a lot of... So down the road, I would highly recommend to move to suspension and then to work with STR. And this this adds complexity on the downstream, but definitely with the right process development, you can reach to your target. So it all depends with the end target of the of the client, and of course how well the uh, market is ready for that. So you have to have the right construct that the product will be excreted from the suspension cell, and you have to have the right cell line. If it's a stable cell line, of course, in and in suspension, you w I would recommend to move to suspension to mimic the mature market of the monoclonal antibody. So it's very flexible, and it depends what what is your end point. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. And then, Chris, what's your experience been of sort of working with adherent versus suspension culture systems? Yeah, at Adentes, we've we've basically started with suspension uh, cells from the beginning, uh, just recognizing that the the volume of, of VG that we need to produce for our patients is going to be quite substantial in particular for many of our programs, which are focused on the neuro neuromuscular space where you just need a large amount of, of, of VG to get to all the target tissues throughout the body. Um, you know, so we, we made that decision early on to go to, to suspension. Um, you know, we, we wanted to, as a multi-product uh, company, not want to have different modalities, different platforms, one, pro you know, one program using suspension, another one with adherence. Um, one, one did the, again, the sort of the platform of the technology and the equipment so we could move readily through, through multiple programs relatively easily. Great. That makes sense. Thank you. And then, Alengo, did you sort of want to give us your insights in terms of the approach uh, from Polyplus in terms of PI Pro for adherent versus suspension? Sure, Eliza. So, in my opinion, it actually really depends on, uh, I would say, the, the manufacturing process that fits best to 
the manu manufacturer, but even more so to each gene therapy product. And I think what we take into account is, um, is the fact that technologies by the manufacturers have already been developed, they've invested into, uh, for example, in-house proprietary adherence or suspension cell lines. So I think we can all agree on the fact that there is no one-size-fits-all approach for these complex gene therapy products and that they can be manufactured efficiently both in endurance and suspension. And therefore, at PolyPlus Transfection, our focus was to make sure that our PI Pro Transfection reagent was most compatible um, for efficient delivery of the sets of plasmids that are needed uh, to produce these viral vectors in both adherent and suspension cells to, of course, ensure highest viral titers. Uh, on top of that, what is key for us is compatibility with most cell culture, most cell culture media that are currently used and uh, making sure that they can obtain re reproducible viral titers at different scale, whether they choose to scale up or scale out, and of course, uh, at different quality grades depending on at which state they are at. And this is why we've got PI Pro, PI Pro HQ, and PI Pro GMP. Fantastic, thank you. <clears throat> and so moving on to our next question, so Alengo touched upon this in her presentation, but it'd be interesting to discuss in a bit more detail what factors the panel think have more influence over transfection efficiency, and how are you able to monitor these in such a dynamic process? You know, what are the key criteria you need to measure to ensure your transfection process is proceeding optimally? Uh, Rachel, perhaps you could start us off here with your thoughts. Yes. Um, as we said, when we are moving to scale up process, uh, it presents a different, ch unique challenges for transient transfection, especially. Uh, we found that uh, when you are mixing uh, and creating the complex in a small scale, it's very easy. You get very consistent and lot, lot to lot of variability is really low. But once you start scaling up for commercialization and GMP production, then the mixing is really critical. You are use, you are, think about it that you are working with very large volume high number of cells, everything is enlarged in terms of magnitude. So the mixing uh, time is really important because we know the complex size impact significantly the efficiency of the transient transfection. So we have to build the criteria when you are enlarging uh, the uh, scale up, how long can you do the transfection because you have to pump it in into the bioreactor. So you cannot use a peristaltic pump, you will break the complex. So, and you have to maintain a certain window of sizing to make a yeah, very high efficient transient transfection. So you have to build a criteria when you're moving to manufacturing and enlarging scale of how long you can let the complex created and you have to take into consideration addition of the complex into the bioreactor, which doesn't exist in a small scale, and also the quality of the product that you are adding in large scale. And you have to remember this is a GMP, so the, the range of operation should be very uh, highly maintained, very tight in, uh, in the batch record. So I would say that uh, this is the major challenges uh, that I think impact the uh, efficiency of the uh, transfection when we are enlarging scale the process. Fantastic. Thank you. And then, Chris, what sort of criteria do you sort of look to, to measure the new transfection, transfection efficiency? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, candidly, I think this is one area where we need probably more analytics or more more development to understand how well you know how well the the complex that we're forming um, is 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 getting into the cells. Is it you know getting into all the cells equally? Is it getting into other cells more efficiently than others? And and the productivity is therefore variable across from cell to cell within your within your cell culture. You know, these are obviously very very challenging challenging things to monitor real time. Um, you know the best. You know the best tried and true. I think we have is to sort of give us at least a little bit of an indication of how well our transfection efficiency went. Is, is cell viability and cell growth, um, sort of uh, old school ways to monitor. But um, you know, again, I think this is one area where the, I think as an industry, um, you know, looking to evolve so that we can have whether it's you know additional PAT or other other ways to sort of monitor more real time how well our, our efficiency is occurring. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, what's your sort of thoughts on this? 
I agree with Chris there. It would be nice to have some more analytics for real-time you know, measurements in terms of what's happening in that environment. Um, but for what we have right now um, in the manufacturing area, we you know, highly proceduralize um, those steps of what we're doing and how we're performing the transfections, particularly for batches that we're running, you know, different, different campaigns, just keeping it as consistent as possible. And so having a consistent mechanism for mixing the time, you know, paying attention to the, the uh, steps in regarding feeding and doing that gravity, uh, again, just making sure that everyone understands the importance of why things are highly proceduralized at that point, but just doing that same thing over and over as much as possible. Um, and then as you have to make changes to your process, whether you're scaling up, um, just, again, all these things need to be considered in terms of how you project and, and how that process will, um, you know, potentially be scaled up if you're going to larger volumes, reactors, and things of that nature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Alengo, sort of following on from Rachel's comment there regarding complex size and, and also looking at a question that's come in from our audience. Uh, what would you say is the right size of DNA to PI complexes for optimal transfection? Yeah, so um, the the range actually, so just to 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 put it simply, the the range of sizes of DNA PI pro complexes is within 400 to 800 nanometers, and of course this is a discussion we've had uh, notably with uh, Paul so with Rachel regarding um, how you can dynamically follow um, the size of the complexes and which can be sort of a measurement to see um, the impact on transaction efficiency as you're scaling up. So that is, of course, one measurement that one can use to check that the complexes are within the optimal size to reach a highest transaction efficiency. Um, yeah. But I think there are also additional parameters, as Rachel mentioned, um, is the way you add the complexes uh, at large scale. Um, so you've got, of course, a the complexation volume, it's a much bigger volume, so as Chris pointed it out, and that's, that's, a, that's a recurrent um, issue. Uh, the incubation time of the complexes, because you need to take into account the time that you need to prepare the complexes and then for the complexes to reach the cells in the bioreactor. And all of these parameters, which I've touched upon uh, earlier during the presentation, are key considerations, which at small scale, scale can be considered as minor, but when you go up to large scale, they, they become a lot more important. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and so moving on to our next question. So how important do the panel think supplier relationships are as you move towards commercial scale? Uh, Chris, perhaps if we come to you here first. Yeah, I think obviously that that partnership is critical. Um, you know, a lot of these reagents, something like a PEI, of course, is 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 a, is, is a critical reagent for our process to to understand the variability in lot to lot. Um, and, and how, how that variability may, may impact our, our cell culture uh, performance. Um, you know, and a lot of these are unique or just coming to, 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 um, to bear on the industry where they have not been part of a, of a previous sort of uh, a licensed uh, process that has had been under more of a, of a GMB or a regulatory microscope. And so just understanding what those critical, critical aspects are of your, of your critical raw materials, things like your DNA, things like your PEI or your other transfection reagents, um, it, it's critically important to then, you know, one, understand what those, what those critical material attributes are and then partner with your, with your supplier to, you know, perform the right type of testing to report on that, to set suitable ranges that, that is amenable to, to both sides of that equation. So, um, yeah, this is something that uh, I think we're, you know, evolving over time and, and as we, you know, get more uh, of a relationship with, with vendors, you know, these are the things that we are, are, are looking at improving and, and getting more visibility to. Yeah, great. Thank you. And then, Alengo, from the supplier perspective, what sort of, you know, initiatives do you guys take to really try and optimize those partnerships with clients? Yes, so I mean, as a supplier, uh, we know there's two critical steps in the way to commercialization. There's the scaling up process development. And for that, at PolyPlus, we have a fully dedicated technical support team, uh, which is there to accompany each manufacturer from the initial process development, so for their, for their scale-up. And the second step is the transitioning from preclinical development to the clinical stage. And for both steps, we're really convinced that the establishment of a supplier-manufacturer good relationship is key, um, because 
during initial process development, the safety and the quality of the ground material can sometimes have a low priority since it's not at the point at that point intended for clinical administration. But now more and more manufacturers are becoming aware that they need to anticipate as early as possible to make sure that they're not going to have to change later on in our process the sourcing of raw materials uh, because of let's say, lack of the quality grade, of the consistency in manufacturing, or of regulatory support to meet the demands of the regulatory agencies. So on top of providing the PI Pro at all the required quality grades, so of course HQ and GMP, uh, what, we, what we make sure to develop with each manufacturer is uh, to accompany them with a um, dedicated regulatory team that is there to provide uh, expert regulatory support, as well as all the necessary documentation, so drug master file if it's for the US FDA, or the documentation describing the chemistry, manufacturing control for um, INPD submission or marketing authorization to any European regulatory agency. So we're really covering both the technical and regulatory support to, to a company. And finally, of course, we know that um, safety is also a big issue, of course, for with viral vectors, because they're being produced and intended for clinical administration, so safety must always come first. And this is why we developed also the PI Pro GMP to be manufactured according to the GMP guidelines, actually both steps, uh, so both at the chemical synthesis steps and at the fill and finish steps to really have the, the quality that is necessary um, for clinical grade administration of these viral vectors. Fantastic, thank you. And Rachel, what's your perspective on this? Uh, yeah, so I agree totally with my previous colleague here on the panel. Uh, I would just add one thing that as a, as a company that is both vendor and both client for this specific product, I would say the relationship are very critical because as long as we both understand the needs and uh, the expectation from each side, we can get to our both target this, uh, the best way and faster. There is a lot of time sensitivity with this market. We have to make sure, as uh, it was mentioned, that there is a transition from development. The clients sometimes like to work with the material from GMP right in the final stage of development, so we need to have a continuous supply of high quality material and we need to provide a forecast so we won't stuck without material when we need that. So, so this is really, and, and, the, and the quality of the product, so, so we do need to have a very strong relationship in order to achieve our goal faster and better. Absolutely, thank you. And then, Cathy, what's your experience been like in managing the various stakeholder groups? Um, the collaboration is, is very important, as everyone has mentioned um, on the panel um, to various degrees, and, and definitely projecting forward, uh, knowing what you're looking for in terms of the quality attributes and, and having materials that come in that are consistently manufactured um, as raw materials to the process is, is very important. Uh, and working with our vendors to give them uh, a sense of how much supply we're going to need. Uh, we've been, you know, sometimes it is hard to make those projections as to what you're going to need, but definitely uh, thinking ahead in the future as to what you're going to need and, and work with your vendors just so that they are aware um, so that they can continue supplying you with that material. But um, fortunately, we've been... Um, fairly lucky with um, having good partnerships with, with the vendors and, and making sure that we have enough of the materials and supply to continue manufacturing. Great, thank you. And then just looking at a few questions from our audience members. Uh, so Alengo, there's a question here saying, could uh, regulatory agencies ask for a QC on residual presence of PI Pro within the final product? The answer is yes. They actually uh, all do. And for that, we've uh, developed a method uh, to detect residual PI Pro in virus samples at different steps of the uh, viral production process. So this detection test is currently at the R&D stage, where we're in the process of optimizing the method for transfer to um, any analytical facility. 
And the goal of this transfer is to be able to validate this method that could be used as a release assay in the future if needed. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, then another question from our panel, uh, from our audience. So have any of the panel tried metabolomics to understand their bioprocess system and how efficient their transfection is? Uh, Chris, I'll just come to you first, but feel free everyone else on the panel to, to chip in if you have. Sure. Yeah. In, in short, yes, we have. We have looked at that, you know, candidly, not so much in sort of a transfection, looking at a transfection efficiency, more in just in terms of trying to look at, um, you know, optimizing the, the cell culture media itself and any sort of feeds that we may be, may be considering to help increase, um, you know, cell growth, cell viability, um, and, and ultimately they have, you know, more cells means more, more hosts to, to make our, our AAV vector in. Um, so, you know, haven't, that, that's a long, fairly arduous process to obviously run your experiment, send it out for this analysis. There can be, you know, quite a bit of turnaround time and, and sometimes you want to move with your development a little bit more quickly than a metabolomic type um, you know, uh, exercise allows you, but um, yeah, I think there's there's more opportunity to explore that a bit further. Absolutely, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in our panel had experience using metabolomics approaches for their bioprocess system analysis? Yeah, I can I can take that one, Rachel from Paul. Uh, it is a very good question because we all know the state of the the cell line. Uh, when you are doing the transfection is very critical. So when we are doing both adherent or suspension cells, we make sure that the cells are in a very good um, shape in terms of health and metabolo uh, I would say metabolic state. So either you are uh, introduce uh, perfusion into your system upstream, as Chris mentioned. So it's all about growing the cells gearing toward the transfection, how well they reach into the, this point, how well they will be accepting the transfection complex in a way more efficient way. So this is a very good question. We are doing uh, a lot of effort, but I think more need to be done in order to understand how to improve this efficiency before the market is moving into stable cell line. Very good point. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so then, just looking, running a bit short on time, but uh, just to go through through the panel one by one, it would be great to hear what your thoughts are regarding, you know, what further improvements you would love to see across the viral vector manufacturing process for this sort of field to really push forward to commercialization and a cost-effective product. Uh, Kathy, if we come to you first. Sure. Um, I guess our clients are always looking for um, increasing um, titers in terms of making the um, process even more efficient. So I think that there's probably some more um, work that can be done in terms of boosting up production levels potentially within the system itself, whether that is pushing cell densities and, and having you know, uh, media that supports uh, the transfection um, and the growth of the cells. Um, maybe feed supplements, things of that nature. But I, I definitely think that um, upstream sometimes is a bit of the limiting factor to generate enough material for our downstream processing. So anything that we could do to achieve um, better titers would, would be um, a great improvement. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, over to you. Well, number one is the uh, raw material quality going into the process dictate a lot without our control on the efficiency of this process. Uh, I would say before the market is moving into a different direction in terms of efficiency, I would like to have more, as Chris mentioned, analytics to make sure to predict how efficient the process will be when we are creating the complex. Not only the size, is that the complex is actually connect, uh, contains all the plasma that we want to have in the right ratio. So I know this is kind of a little bit uh, high bar to target, mm -hmm. but that will be my wish thinking about increasing the efficiency of the uh, transfection into the cells currently that we need that, 
both in, uh, uh, in adherent and suspension cells because we are struggling with uh, the number of viral vector per cell, the specific productivity, and I think this by increasing uh, the, the likelihood that all the plasmid will go to each cell in the ratio we are targeting, this is my, uh, this is my dream actually. So yeah, and I would like to have analytic to prove it so when you go to the manufacturing, uh, you will have it correctly till you build your own uh, cell type. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's uh, definitely a good idea to aim high, especially in this sector, which holds so much promise. And then, Chris, what would be on your wish list? <laughs> um, everything that's been mentioned, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe just one or two things to add as well. I think we we've, we focused a lot on the efficiency of getting the the transfection complex to the cell and taken up by the cell, the infectivity and the productivity related around that. Um, I think the other thing that, you know, if, if I could have a wish list would just be also the efficiency of the, the packaging of the, of the viral capsid. You know, it's one thing to get a lot of production of your, of your, of your capsid and your, your gene of interest. Um, it's another thing to get it packaged correctly and, 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 you know, get as high of efficiency there. You have, as per, you know, the highest number of percent full capsids as possible. Um, that would be on my wish list along with, yeah, just ultimately, you know, just other things that, that, that drive down cost of goods. I think this is one of the, the bigger challenges that we look at, you know, as, as we look to late stage and ultimately commercializing our programs, you know, are they going to be viable to manufacture, you know, at the, at the scale we are for the patient populations that we are. So anything that we can do to, to really drive down those cost of goods in this very expensive manufacturing process is, is, would also be on my wish list. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great list. And then finally, Alingo, coming to you. So I would say, so I would totally agree with, uh, with both Chris, uh, Rachel, and Kathy. Um, in terms of transfection efficiency, uh, we're, as a transfection uh, company, working constantly on, on the transfection efficiency, and we are working on innovative transfection reagents to further improve transfection efficiency in terms of yeah, uh, improving delivery of uh, several plasmids at a time to improve virus titer yield. So this is um, no, no longer on our wish list. This is ongoing. We've got a, an R&D team dedicated to that. So hopefully we'll have something uh, ready in the pipe soon. Excellent. Exciting times ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, unfortunately, we have run out of time today. Um, thank you very much to our audience for joining us today and for submitting your questions. There are quite a few that came in that are quite technical, and we will be passing those on to PolyPlus, and they will contact you directly. And the same with any other ones that you've put forward to our panel that we just couldn't quite get to today. Um, that just leaves me to thank our excellent panel today, Chris, Rachel, Kathy, and Alengo. Thank you so much indeed for joining me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. And uh, we will be sending the on-demand recording link around tomorrow. So look out for an email from me in your inbox. And um, yeah, thank you all very much indeed for joining us today.